On today's episode of Fired Up, we live in the United States of America, right? They, they say it's the land of the free, home of the brave, where the government cannot unjustly confiscate your assets. Or can they? Donald Trump once said, they're not coming after me, they're coming after you. I'm just in the way. And, and never has that been more true than today. I mean, it's actually scary what's going on out there. So we are going to talk Donald Trump, Elon Musk, the confiscation of assets, and even some Bitcoin, all on today's episode of Fired Up. So let's kick things off by starting with a little bit of background, going back, you know, way back to around 1776 when this nation was really created. So, you know, our founding fathers, they had this vision. It was an awesome vision, a great vision. And they were the architects of, of assembling the greatest country, more than likely in the history of, of, of mankind, right? And one of the things that we were all awarded or guaranteed from our founding fathers was these unalienable rights. And we built this country where we can have those certain unalienable rights like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We can have a country with limited government. We can have a country where citizens can personally and privately own things, own stuff, own houses, own investment accounts where it's not owned by the government. We have a constitution, which is the supreme law of the land where individuals have rights, something that, that didn't always exist in the past in history. And then we have the balance of powers, right? We have the executive branch, we have the legislative branch, we have the judicial branches. And the great thing about the balance of powers is that it creates this system of checks and balances. Now, the question becomes, what happens when that system of checks and balances is no longer checking and balancing each other out? What happens when all three of those branches are actually all aligned and working together, when they're in cahoots, when they're scheming together? Well, I mean, it seems like that's where we're at now, unfortunately. And things start to resemble a third world country or a banana republic. Now let's take a look at this tweet from Elon Musk. When you hear the names of legislation or anything done by the government, it is worth remembering that the group that sent so many people to the guillotine during the French Revolution was called the Committee of Public Safety, not the Cut Off Their Heads Committee. And I think that really strikes a nerve and that is very relevant given what's going on today between the executive, judicial, and legislative branches. We obviously have some big issues. Um, we'll get to Elon Musk in just a few minutes, but I wanna back up. I wanna start talking about Trump first and foremost. Um, and in order for me to talk about what's going on with Trump um, and how you know there are these politically motivated efforts to confiscate assets, whether it be Donald Trump, Elon Musk, you know, and if they can go after two of the uh, of our country's most successful, most powerful people, that's scary. I mean, that means they can come after all of us. So um, I want to start off with um, there was a settlement earlier this week. Uh, Donald Trump was ordered to pay eighty three million dollars to E. Jean Carroll. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. I want to back up and, and let everyone know how we actually got to that point. So. As a byproduct of the Me Too movement, hashtag Me Too, there, there came this New York Adult Survivors Act, which completely opened up Pandora's box. So in May of 2022, New York's state legislation amended state law so that it actually started to allow victims of alleged sexual abuse, whereby the statute of limitations had expired to come forward one last time without any rules for one full year. And in that year, they were able to file a civil suit, not a criminal charge, but a civil suit where you're suing for damages, normally money. 
And it was for one year, from November 24th of 22 to November 24th of 2023. Now, why might you ask, do we have a statute of limitations in the first place? Well, that would be to protect would-be defendants, whether it's criminal or civil, from unfair legal action. Unfair legal action. That's why you have a statute of limitations to prevent the court system from being unfair. Now, why might the court system be unfair? Because after a certain amount of time, whether it's five years, 10 years, 20, or almost 30, as in the case with E. Jean Carroll, evidence may no longer exist at all. Evidence may be damaged. It may be less accurate, less precise. Any potential eyewitnesses that may have existed may not remember what happened 30 years ago. So when you, as New York, when you tell your citizens that the legal system isn't going to be fair for defendants for one full year, come and get your money while you can, who do you think that's going to bring out? I mean, that's obviously going to attract bad actors, people that have dollar signs in their eyes, people that want money, right? I think the next thing I want to touch base on is I want to explain the difference between criminal and civil trials. Now, obviously, we know that, that you know, they're, they're going after Donald Trump for, I think it's 91 criminal charges. Now, all of those cases are highly flawed. Uh, my opinion is that it's political persecution. Uh, the Jack Smith January 6th case uh, apparently was just removed from the court docket over the course of the last 24 hours, so it's no longer even listed on the court docket. Super strange. The Fannie Willis uh, case down in Georgia obviously has quite a bit of uh, ethical and moral issues surrounding it, as we found out that she hired a prosecutor who didn't have any experience in prosecuting RICO cases paid him 10 times more than, than she paid the other two prosecutors. And it just so happened that uh, it was her romantic lover. And then you have, uh, what's the, the third criminal case? Oh, it's the, um, the hush money for Stormy Daniels, which is very, very weak in and of itself. But outside of the, the criminal stuff, we're talking, we are talking civil lawsuits here. You know, you have these, these um, plaintiffs who are suing for damages. So when you look at the threshold of what it takes for a defendant to be found guilty or liable, in a criminal case, the threshold is you have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, which is essentially saying there's a 95% chance plus that this happened. I mean, this was proven beyond a reasonable doubt. That is a very high standard, a very high threshold. In a civil case, the threshold is much lower. It is a preponderance of the evidence. And what does that mean? That means there's a greater than 50% chance it's true. It might be true. It might be false. But I think it might be more true than false. Like a very, very low threshold, especially when you're talking uh, $83 million in penalties, if you might be guilty or might be liable. So I think it's key to understand that the New York Adult Survivors Act, it allowed civil complaints with a very low threshold where it's much, much easier for the defendant to lose. Now, E. Jean Carroll, she's 80 years old. She writes this memoir in 2019 where uh, I don't think it was expected to be a, a bestseller. So she claimed that Trump raped her in this memoir in the 1990s. Now, I don't know whether he did or not, and it's not my, not my duty to, to, to dispute whether or not it happened, but we need to kind of take a look at some of the underlying circumstances. So this New York Adult Survivors Act, what it did is it opened up a window for her to file a rape lawsuit. Again, you only needed to say that there was a 51% chance it happened. Now, the strangest part about E. Jean Carroll's lawsuits, two of them, is that she didn't even hire the attorney. She didn't bankroll these lawsuits. These lawsuits were bankrolled by Reed Hoffman, a longtime Democratic donor who actually now is backing Nikki Haley. So it's this Reed Hoffman that wanted to go after Trump, right? So 
this, you know, the, the, the rape lawsuit, Trump was found liable, $5 million in damages. Uh, when this memoir came out, Trump said, you know, he called E. Jean Carroll a liar, and, and even after the, the rape verdict, continued to call her a liar, uh, obviously to protect his reputation. And, you know, I mean, if you think about it, if you're writing a memoir about your life, and, and maybe your life wasn't all that interesting, um, it's, you know, I, I would think that it's, it's not all that uncommon for people to exaggerate, embellish, maybe even lie. And again, I'm not calling her a liar. I just think the circumstances are incredibly strange. You judge for yourself. Only she knows and, and Donald Trump. Those are the only two people that, that actually know. But look, when, so when this book came out, when her memoir came out, Trump called her a liar. That's when the defamation lawsuit kicked in. She sued for, I, I believe it was like $24 million in damages. The judge just gave her $83 million this week, above and beyond, right? So, you know, again, and this whole, you know, Adult Survivors Act, it, it provides people, potentially bad actors, with the ability to sue other people without any evidence. And again, who am I to say whether or not this happened? All I can tell you is that she seems completely unhinged. She seems batshit crazy. Let's, let's, let's be frank here. I mean, she's been quoted in the past as saying, rape is sexy. She, she thinks it's sexy, like, like a romance novel based on rape. I, I don't know. I've never heard anyone who actually was raped call it sexy. Um, she's making light of it. Apparently, there was no evidence. She never yelled. She never called police. And this happened supposedly in the mid-90s. So we were talking about 30 years ago. It's a long time ago. And then on top of that, she just acted like a complete jackass, a complete fool with Rachel Maddow. She was on that show. She, was, she went completely off her rocker. She was bragging about all the different ways she's going to spend Trump's money. Let's take a look at that clip. You've talked about using some of Trump's money that you're about to get um, to help shore up women's rights. Do you know what that might be, what that might look like. Yes, or, Rachel. Here it comes. Yes. Tell me. I had such, such great ideas <laughs> for all the good I'm going to do with this money. First thing, Rachel, you and I are going to go shopping. We're going to get completely <laughs> new <laughs> wardrobes, new shoes, motorcycle for Crowley, new fishing rod for Robbie. Rachel, what do you want? Penthouse? <laughs> it's yours, Nothing. Rachel. Penthouse and uh, France? You want France? You want to go fishing nope. in France? No? Oh. All right. All right. Okay. That's a joke. That's a joke. <laughs> Got to backpedal on that one. Although joke. if, if Absolutely me insane. I mean, that thing is just cringeworthy. Uh, to me, I don't know how she always talks. I, I'm not one to sit around and watch E. Jean Carroll videos every single day of the week, but very, very strange. I mean, she almost, she was like slurring her words, so she almost sounded... Sounded drunk there. I mean, I don't know if she was. I again, I don't watch E. Jean Carroll videos regularly. Just a very, very strange way to act. I mean, and you have to ask yourself: Does that sound like someone who's been raped to you? Again, I'm not here to judge. I just think it was very, very strange that she's like celebrating, you know, and and she's smiling ear to ear in the video, super happy, and she was so far out, you know, out of her lane that her attorney had to step in and say, it's a joke, right? I mean, oof, that's, that's brutal. Um, very, very awful video that we, that we just saw there. Um, and I think it just, it says a little bit about her character. Now, moving on from that. So Donald Trump got hit with 5 million and then 83 million on the E. Jean Carroll situation. We're now gonna move on to the New York fraud case, as they call it, fraud, with Attorney General Letitia James. So she claims that Donald Trump profited and, and accumulated his vast empire by lying and overstating his property values. And, th and that's how he got all of his profits. So she now wants to strip Donald Trump of all of his wealth gains <laughs> that were a result of him securing real estate loans. And let's remember, that was his business. That was his primary business was real estate. So Obviously, when you're building a real estate empire, you are going to take out loans for uh, essentially all of the profits you're going to generate. Now, Letitia James, in trying to prove 
that this was fraud. She went through and she and, she and her team did valuations of all these properties. Specifically when it comes to Mar-a-Lago, uh, she claims that Mar-a-Lago is only worth $25 million. Now, there was a Palm Beach luxury real estate broker who in 2021, before the lawsuit, before this fraud lawsuit, stated that it was worth a, about a billion dollars with a B, a billion. The loan officer that helped Donald Trump from Deutsche Bank said that what would happen, you know, the, the overestimation of property values is not atypical. It's very common. People overestimate the values of their properties all the time. I mean, they have an emotional attachment to them. It's, a property is always worth more to you than it is to someone else when it's your property, you know? So he stated that the bank does their own due diligence. They do their own underwriting. And it was the bank that approved the loans based on their own underwriting, which was based on Donald Trump's ability to repay the loans. And guess what? He paid them all back. Every single penny, every cent. Nobody was hurt. So this is a victimless offense. There is no victim. I don't even know how there could be damages awarded. There's no victim in this case. So what you're seeing happen here is you are seeing the government try to confiscate potentially 370 million of the family's wealth. And we should have that judgment out probably, uh, you know, by early next week. I think they said February 5th is, is potentially the target. So we'll, we'll see what happens there. I think, uh, you know, if he's found liable, really in all three of these trials, he's gonna end up appealing them. But, you know, what do they all have in common? These are all politically motivated. You know, I, I think if, if they can't, land this guy in prison with the 91 criminal charges, they're going to keep him out of the election by bankrupting him. They're going to try and just erode his wealth. Um, you know, Letitia James, she ran on getting Trump. Um, Arthur Engeron, I believe is his name, uh, in the, the New York fraud case, he's a Trump hater. Judge Kaplan, Trump hater. So, I mean, in the courtroom, we don't have time to go into details, but it, there's never been a level playing field in the courtroom. The deck's always been stacked against Trump. I mean, you know, Judge Kaplan in this E. Jean Carroll trial uh, actually mentored E. Jean Carroll's attorney. Like, how is that not a conflict of interest? Like, that's, that to me sounds like a very, very big conflict and, and certainly uh, something that's going to be addressed in the appeals process. So, you know, it is pretty clear that the, at least the legislative and judicial branches were not checking and balancing each other, but they worked in cahoots. And obviously, as Trump says, he's pointing all the fingers at the left, at the Democrats, whether it's Joe Biden or, you know, Kathy Hochul or whoever it might be, he's pointing the fingers at them. Is he right? Possibly. Now, skipping forward to Elon Musk. I mean, if you think 83 million is bad, if you think 5 million is bad for Donald Trump to E. Jean Carroll, we gotta talk about Elon Musk because six years ago, Elon Musk, probably the most dynamic CEO I've ever come across. I mean, you know, sometimes he's kind of shooting from the hip like a cowboy, but man, is he dynamic. And he's done a fantastic job with Tesla. Six years ago, Tesla was worth 59 billion and it was really on the verge of bankruptcy. I mean, it seemed like every quarter as we were awaiting earnings reports, we were wondering if that was going to be the last quarter for Elon Musk and Tesla. And Musk bet his entire life, his entire fortune on the success of Tesla. When the company was worth 59 billion and trying to get back on track, he decided to make his compensation entirely performance-based. And this was the long shot part of this performance-based deal. If somehow, some way, he was able to take that $59 billion company that was on the verge of bankruptcy and grow it to 650 billion, he'd get paid 55 billion. Doesn't sound that bad. It sounds like even after his compensation, the company still went from 59 billion to almost 600 billion. I mean, that's fantastic. If a guy can do that when a company is on the verge of bankruptcy, what's he won? <laughs> what is wrong with rewarding a winner? I mean, nobody thought it would be possible. The guy shot for the stars and he actually, he hit it. He surpassed it. He surpassed $650 billion by the end of 2020. It's worth a little less than that today. It's worth about $600 billion. The issue is we had this, uh, this whiny snowflake 
shareholder who, who fought back, and I'm, I'm stealing the whiny snowflake term, uh, from Ken Griffin, he used it this, this past week of Citadel. Um, this whiny snowflake said the comp was excessive, and a Delaware court just snatched, just robbed, just stole that $55 billion windfall away from Elon Musk, the world's richest man. You might ask yourself why? Well, because the guy who was once a fan favorite of the left, a guy who was once saving the planet and doing everything the climate change cult wanted, everything the progressives, progressives wanted, he's now an enemy of the left. Why? Because he believes in freedom of speech and he's a free thinker. What do we make of all this? Well, look, we all have property rights that are laid out under the 5th and 14th Amendments of the Constitution. We also have due process, where trials are supposed to be fair. Decisions are supposed to be made by neutral decision makers. I've already talked about how these courts were not neutral decision makers. You know, these are people who just despise Donald Trump. Were these trials fair? It doesn't sound that way. I mean, there were certain things that Donald Trump was not allowed to bring in his defense. Um, he wasn't able to speak much from, from a testifying standpoint, so it didn't seem fair or uh, that we had neutral decision makers. And we certainly have property being unjustly taken from two of the world's most powerful people. So, I mean, look, I would have to say that the legal system in these cases is far from fair. It's far from objective. Um, and, and it seems to be targeting certain people who are political enemies of those who are in charge. Um, scary times. You know, I, I mean, the biggest thing that, that I'm worried about is we are, we're on a, a very dark path. I mean, if they can do this to Trump, if they can do this to Elon Musk, they can do it to me, to you, to us. Like, what prevents them from doing that to all of us? The government potentially confiscating our assets is, is probably you know, one, of the, one of the scariest things that, that I've, I've come across lately. Um, you know, and, and that kind of segues me into trying to figure out like what, other than making sure we change the, the lay of the land politically, like what, what are our options? as it relates to trying to shelter some of our assets. And look, I mean, you know, when you talk crypto, I know some people love it, some people hate it. It seems like there's really nobody in the middle. You either love it or you hate it, like two extremes. But I want to talk crypto. And, and there's been a lot of talk about a central bank digital currency, CBDC. And that scares the hell out of a lot of people because the fear is that if you, me, us, if we say or do something the government doesn't like, if we don't get a vaccine, if we don't wear a mask, if we speak out against the left, if, if we question something that's being done politically, giving money to Ukraine or whatever it might be, they can, they can shut off access to our money. Scary, right? Um, so, you know, one of the things that I want to look at real quick here is I found it very interesting. Um, I think it was about a week, week and a half ago. Jenny Johnson, the CEO of Franklin Templeton, right, right as the, the Bitcoin ETFs rolled out, she was on CNBC's Squawk Box talking about Bitcoin and talking about some of the reasons that people want to own Bitcoin. Let's take a look. One of the things that made me a believer is as I went around the world talking to people who would tell you, I, I had somebody who said, I keep 50% of my savings in Bitcoin because if I say the wrong thing in my country, I could have my assets confiscated. Uh, I remember talking to somebody in Israel who said, my parents and their parents had all of their assets confiscated. They keep a portion of it in Bitcoin. So there's a fear component to it um, that is considered almost a insurance or, or safety component. So there you have it. I mean, Jenny Johnson, the CEO of Franklin Templeton, I mean, she's not a right-wing conspiracy theorist. Like this is, she's the CEO of Franklin Templeton Investments. <laughs> like this, for her to say that one of the, one of the things that made her a believer 
was uh, that there's people out there who want to own Bitcoin to prevent their government from confiscating their assets. I mean, immediately you think of places like Venezuela, you think of places like Nicaragua, um, but you don't think of America. And maybe we should be, given what's happening to Trump, Elon Musk, and, and I mean, who knows, who knows who's next, right? Um, the government obviously is, is, is becoming more and more shady, it seems, by the day. Now, it's getting more specific about not just crypto, but talking Bitcoin. A as I mentioned earlier, like, I mean, Bitcoin, it's just, it, it stirs up too much emotion in people. Like, you're either a raging bull and you love it, or you're a raging bear and you hate it and you say it's worthless. It's, it's a fugazi, you know? Um, there's nobody ever in the middle. And I think that's where you need to be to understand and appreciate the potential of Bitcoin and where it might fit in. And, and I am, I'm in the middle. I consider myself a Bitcoin realist. Like, I, you'll never see me or hear me talking about having 100% of my money in crypto. Like, I, that's not for me. That's not what I do. Um, that's way too risky. I would never put all the wealth I've accumulated in something where I, I don't know what's going to happen with it. But I do think there's a case for it. I, I think there's a case for it. I think there's value to it. I think there are benefits to it. I just think you need to, to be prudent about owning some. The question is how much? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm 43 years old. For me, could I put 10% of my liquid net worth in, in Bitcoin and sleep at night? Sure. I mean, if it goes to zero, I still have 90% of all my money. Okay. I mean, I've got 20 plus years until I retire. I, I think that would be reasonable. Maybe if I'm more risk averse, maybe it's only two or 3% of my net worth. If I'm super aggressive, maybe it's 20%. And maybe you're not 43, maybe you're 53 or 63. So look, you need to find that sweet spot for everyone. But you know, for me, watching, you know, watching what's happening to Donald Trump, watching what's happening to Elon Musk, watching this video from the CEO of, of Franklin Templeton, it struck a nerve with me. And I think at a bare minimum, I'm going to think differently about crypto going forward. Um, I would encourage everyone to think differently. You don't have to be a lover or a hater. Like you don't, you can be somewhere in the middle and, and you can own it in a prudent amount to avoid the government potentially confiscating assets or, or shutting down access to your money um, as the government continues to get stranger and stranger. So, I mean, look, I, I would say Given the current situation of where we're at as a country, uh, what we're seeing happening, you know, now that we're seeing the, the United States start to do things that banana republics do, um, I think it's prudent to consider owning some. And, you know, if, if one, of, one of my favorite authors recently, uh, Ray Dalio, I mean, he's obviously a hedge fund titan, and he's sharing his, his knowledge that he's accumulated over the last, you know, several years, several decades, of working with people, uh, of working with investments and stuff like that. And in his book, Principles of a Changing World Order, Ray Dalio says that the average empire lasts 250 years before beginning to fall. That puts us at 2026. Only time will tell if we last longer than those 250 years. I'll always bet on America, but I gotta tell you, becoming tougher and tougher with all these things that are happening. Thanks for joining us. Talk to you next time.